Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whenever you're watching this. Uh, once again, my name is Amber White, and I am the director of the University of Texas at Arlington Pre-Law Center. And we have a very, very special guest today. Joining us all the way from sunny California is Jesus Flores, uh, uh, excuse me, Jesus Flores Rodriguez. Jesus was born in, I'm going to mess up the name of this town. I'm going to have you correct me later. <laughs> it's okay. Palo Cintiflan, Jalisco, Mexico. Did I get that right or close? <laughs> It's uh, Hello Sotitlan. I know it's like a long, long name. It's a name. beautiful <laughs> name and you say it so beautifully. Um, oh, thank you. But yes, yes, yes. Jalisco, Mexico. Um, and, and he came to the United States with the rest of his family to seek better access to medical attention for his older sister. Uh, he grew up in Los Angeles where despite his language barrier as an ESL student, he managed to graduate with high honors from UC Davis in 2017 with a BA in political science. Now, while he was at UC Davis, he was part of the founding staff of the AB 540 and Undocumented Student Center, which is huge. Um, and he participated in the Dream Summer uh, in 2015, where he created a resource guide outlining healthcare access and opportunities for undocumented families in Sacramento and Yellow Counties. Now, currently, Jesus is focusing his time and advocacy um, at Immigrants Rising, which is the purpose of our discussion today. It's the focus of our talk today. Uh, at Immigrants Rising, um, he works with the Legal Services Program as their programming lead. There, he works to expand the work of the pre-law program, a pipeline program he created at Immigrants Rising to support undocumented individuals interested in applying to law school. As a person who loves to travel, Jesus has created resources and guides like Traveling While Undocumented and About the Real ID. Thank you so much for joining us, Jesus. You are uh, a wonder. And I didn't even get a chance to read your entire uh, bio. You've done so many great things. Oh, thank you, Amber. Yeah, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Yes. Well, so um, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, I, I kind of gave a general background, but I'd love to know a little bit more about you and your story and, you know, just kind of how you came to to be where you are now. Yeah. So um, for folks that are joining, uh, also to give a little bit of context and how I got to the work that I am to like doing now is I actually grew up undocumented in the United States, um, still am. And for me, I always grew up with this I like mindset of like having to hide or having to kind of lie about who I was. Um, I also identify as a gay man. Um, so like there were just various levels of just like hiding who my real identity was. Um, and I saw it as like a way of just like, uh, at least like my immigration status as a way of like, um, like I, I felt like I was this pawn in like this chessboard uh, where my, my life was being decided on by other people, mostly like politicians, policymakers. So for me, um, kind of, and this is for all like you pre-law folks that are interested in going into policymaking or, or, or like the law in general. Uh, for me, it was mostly an interest of like, I wanted to, to take agency over my story. I wanted to take agency over my future. And that's when I started to create a lot of these resources, this, this pipeline where folks, where I was, I realized that I wasn't the only one with these questions. I wasn't the only one uh, that had these aspirations, um, this mindset that others were just kind of fed up and they wanted to be like, no, I wanted to, to take agency over my own story. Um, and that's how I started to create a lot of these resources. I love it. I love it. Well, you're doing a beautiful thing. And definitely I can tell that um, just judging off of how the group is growing, that a lot of people are receptive and, and are really receiving what you're doing for the community. So I'm going to get more into um, the the program Immigrants Rising in a bit, but I like to talk generally, you know, um, what is the first thing that a prospective law student who has the status as international, undocumented, DACA, what's the first thing that they need to know about applying to law school? 
That's a really good question, Amber. I think something that they should really ask themselves first is like, is it like what their timeline is? Like they should think about like, when do I want to apply? If this is, this comes after they have already decided that they want to, um, they really have to think about like, do I really see myself in the future? Like doing um, some field in the law. Uh, and then also like, can I really work as a, like someone in the legal field? Two things that you should consider is like, where do I want to practice law? Um, and again, like not everyone that goes to law school gets to be a lawyer. Like uh, there's various different fields that you can go into, not necessarily being a lawyer. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like, where do I want to, it, it, let's say, for example, you want to be a lawyer, you have to think about where do I want to practice? And then do I have work authorization? I think those are two different things um, that you should consider, especially like, for example, in California, I think it's one of the states that um, we're very lucky where we do have a lot of resources for folks that are, that are like international, that are undocumented. And this is, it's good. Like, for example, if you're undocumented and you want to practice law, then you're able to, um, you're able to, uh, since there's a lot of people with licenses that are able to do it regardless of their immigration status. And um, if you have work authorization, but if you don't, then there's also other more creative routes that you can take like independent contracting or, or doing like a workers co-op or maybe considering working abroad. Uh, sometimes you could get employed by like companies abroad. Um, so there's just like different avenues that you can consider but I think definitely just thinking about like can I do it where do I want to do it and then when do I want to do it so like start to think about your timeline when do I want to take the LSAT um, the law school admissions test uh, or the GRE since some law schools are starting to accept that as well or in some cases also the GMAT um, and yeah just also start to think about your recommenders I think most law schools accept at least one recommender. And I think for, for most of them, uh, they do want like an academic recommendation. I do encourage you all, like if you're still in school and this is someone like I have been out of school for like, I want to say eight years now. <laughs> and I want to say that like start building those relationships. If you're still in school, start building those relationships. And it doesn't have to be like, a professor, you know, someone with like a high title, as long as it's someone that can really speak to your abilities, um, your academic abilities, it could be like um, a TA. Like for me, I had a TA when I was applying to law schools and they read my essays. It was mostly my TA who was really reviewing my homework, my, my exams, um, so just really think about like, who are you able to open up a little bit better, uh, who's more accessible to you and start reaching out to them, start building those relationships with them. Even if like those office hours are a little awkward, uh, it'll be worth it a few years from now. Yes. It's so funny. Um, a, a piece of advice that I share quite often is, you know, who is the person that you have felt comfortable opening up to that knows your story? I sound like I'm about to go into, you know, Hamilton, who, who tells your story, but effectively that that's really what it's about. Who do you mm -hmm. um, feel confident can tell the best story about you to the law schools so that they can ensure that the law schools see you for you. I know the hardest thing that yeah. there is to do is to talk about yourself. So, you know, you got to talk about yourself yeah. in an application, but don't, don't take all the burden. Have somebody else help you out and, and write something great about you through that. So, um, uh, you know, piggybacking, um, uh, if you'll agree with me, I think also if you have uh, people that you've worked with um, in in volunteer capacity, you know, sometimes students will, you know, have a, you know, we have Habitat for Humanity, things like that. If you've done something like that, you know, you've done it quite often. Those are good people to work with too for, for Rex. I think that's fantastic. When I was going to- Absolutely. I, I do also want to add before we go into the next question. Please. Um, something that has helped me and um, a lot of my mentees 
has been um, creating, like making the process as easy as possible for the recommender. So mm -hmm. like uh, maybe creating like a, like a cover letter or like something like maybe like an outline of like, Hey, this is why I want you to be my recommender, especially if you're reaching out to like educators, like saying like, Hey, I wrote this essay for you, like just to like refresh their memory. Um, this is a great I got the, and then maybe like sharing like the work that you did with them. Um, and then also just highlighting, like, can you please like talk about, I don't know, like my leadership ability or my um, academic performance in your class or can you highlight like just really I think I've also done recommendations for people and I think for me like on the other side it's really helpful to get like clear and concise um, guidelines of like what it is that the recommendee wants in the recommendation um, and that has helped me like even in my personal statements from other people um just letting them know and you also want to make sure that like your application is like it shows you in a wholesome way so it's not just talking about your academic abilities but like amber said like what if you did habitat for humanity right i'm sure there's other like extracurricular activities that you might want to highlight and maybe that recommender can highlight like your humanity your selflessness your ability to really engage with people um of different walks of life so I'm sure like like make sure that you also make those recommender recommendations work for you in that it also paints a good picture of you not just like the academic side but also you can also make sure that recommenders can really highlight other aspects of who you are so that's something I always tell people <laughs> I like that I like that a hundred percent. Well, and I mean, you kind of brought up a, a an important uh, point in what you were saying, and it it brought up a question in my mind that I I know that probably others will have as well. So, you know, in the application itself that you are filling out, you know, like the personal statement where you're talking about all about you. Let's hear it. Do or do do or don't. Do we talk about our status? Is it something that we go ahead and discuss? Is it something that we kind of you know, leave off and, and focus on something else, you know, how do we approach, you know, writing about being DACA, writing about being undocumented or international? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think, I don't think there's like a, like a white or black response or like a yes or no response. I think it really, like, it's really just about the framing. Like, how do you want to frame your story? Um, it really depends on like, how is it that you want to make sure that you highlight your immigration status as a way of just showing that you have been like resilient and that you're able to surpass like, like law school. Cause I don't think sharing your immigration status, like as is, is going to grant you <laughs> your admissions to law school. Um, but if you are able to frame it in a way that is almost like a character building quality about you, um, that it's a quality about you that has been able to like, I don't know, showcase that you have been like, despite that you have overcome that challenge um, in like looking for resources and I'm sure like economic, like, right, like financial, trying to navigate a lot of like financial situations and different systems um, and yet you're still here today. So if you're able to like frame that and show it in your application and also trust like someone in your network, right? I think for me, my personal statement, I think I did like maybe like 10 different drafts and I had people with different like um, strengths. Like for example, I had someone that was really good at grammar and I asked them to review it <laughs> um, and just to focus on the grammar versus I had like my best friend and he reviewed it like just to make sure that it really spoke um, to me like it really showed who I was because sometimes you read a personal statement you're like wait a minute that's that's not you <laughs> um, so just really make sure that like one um, your immigration status if you do decide to talk about it you don't have to talk about it but if you do decide to talk about it um you frame it in a way that is also able to highlight you um, and make you show that like, despite that you're gonna go through law school and be resilient and you're gonna over overcome that challenge. 
Um, and then also that you're able to, I don't know, just show that like, um, it's not the only quality about you. And I'm sure there's other factors in the application too, like your addenda or the diversity statement um, that you're able to show like different aspects of you. But again, it's not a requirement um, to talk about your immigration status. It's definitely, um, it varies by comfort level. Some folks decide to talk about it. Some folks decide not to talk about it. Um, and just talking about it as is, is not going to grant you admission. Um, but it, again, it's all depends on the framing um, and really just uh, depending on the people around you in your network to really just say like, hey, this really reflects who you are. Um, this really speaks to your voice. Um, I really recommend that when it comes to the personal statement. Excellent. And um, I, I did have um, some individuals write in about, you know, different questions that they had. Um, and so one of the questions that I, I received was, you know, how can an applicant tell whether or not a law school uh, or law school admissions has certain, um, and the, the word that was used was prejudice, but uh, prejudice against, you know, undocumented DACA, what have you, you know, what are, how do you distinguish basically schools that we should be applying to versus schools that maybe we we should not be applying to in that regard? Mm, that's a good question, especially like if uh, for folks that are joining or like hearing this and they're considering law schools, I think that's a good thing to ask yourselves, um, especially when you're making that list of like target schools, reach schools, right? Um, right. Like, is it even worth it? Uh, that's definitely something I had to ask myself. I think uh, I think I want to start with like saying that like folks that review applications are human and bias is always a factor um, regardless, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure law schools do their best to also kind of eliminate a little bit of that bias. Um, and I, But I think in terms of like things that a lot of the students should consider when considering law schools is think about like the state policies or the city policies, or I honestly like also recommend like if you haven't been to that state before, checking it out as well. And like, if you feel like it's not the right fit for you, um, like for example, I've been to Tennessee and I think it's a great state like nature wise, but when it comes to like policies supporting um I don't know, people of color or people um, of different sexual orientations or uh, folks that are undocumented. I I didn't really feel like it was a state for me. So I think it's just like those things that you should consider. Um, think about what state policies are in place. Do your research about the state. Do your research about the school. Reach out to the school. Something I tell my mentees in our pre-law program is Sometimes like, well, actually what I hear from students is like, they sometimes would reach out to law schools and they would not hear a response or sometimes they would be like very bad about responding to their inquiries through email or sometimes it would just give them like a rude response. I think that's also a good factor to consider as well. Like how well, how adequate are their services served for you? How are they able to respond to your questions to your situation, to your story. Um, if folks don't know how to answer your questions or if they just avoid them, then that's probably not the best fit for you. So again, think about the state policies that are in place. Think about like just the vibe. <laughs> I know that's like a question, like my brother's a Gen Z, so he says vibe a lot. Think about the vibe. <laughs> um, if it doesn't feel right, then it's not for you. Um, and then also uh, reach out to the school that you're interested in, reach out to them, be honest about your questions and say like, how do you guys have like a resource center for students like me? Um, or what are some like uh, uh, institutional scholarships that are available? Like, are they are they open to students like me? If they're not able to answer those questions or if, or if they're nice, but they're like, I'm sorry, we don't have any of those, then I don't know, maybe that can really help you factor your decision, whether that school is right for you or not. But I know that like a lot of the students I've talked to, that has really helped them 
um, and being able to make that decision, whether that school was right or not. Well, and I definitely appreciate that perspective because, you know, for the students that, you know, are just generally fitting within the category of diverse, I know the term diversity is not really great right now. Um, and it's, it's very difficult for a lot of students to be able to feel like they can take pride in that diversity or express that diversity when it comes to the application process for fear that, okay, if I bring this up, you know, will it be looked at in an adverse way, given, you know, the most recent Supreme Court rulings or how, you know, for example, um, we've had uh, different uh, viewpoints uh, of diversity in the state of Texas here. So, you know, I, I think that the point that you bring up really does resonate with, you know, not just the target audience, but with a lot of people that are applying to law school that have these concerns really, you know, about how to approach, you know, which schools will be maybe open and friendly to the ideas surrounding um, these differences. And so, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate that, that guidance. That's, I think that's great feedback. And I personally am a person I, before vibes was, you know, vibes, I, it was intuition. <laughs> and I'm a person that, you know, gets that sense of, you know, okay, I don't know that I like this environment or what have you. So certainly I think that that's really great uh, advice and guidance. I love that. Um, yes. Well, and the other thing, I, oh, sorry. No, no, um, please, the other thing please. I want to say too, is um, if you do plan on practicing law, if you do want to be like a lawyer, so if you want to go to law school and like uh, do the bar exam, um, also something to consider are check the American Bar Associations in the States that you're, if you're planning to, um, I'm not sure about Texas, if they, I try to do a little bit of Googling, but I'm, I'm guessing I have to call the American Board Association just to make sure that like, or email them um, if Texas allows undocumented. Oh, the Texas um, immigrants bar? Oh, Texas State Bar? To, to pass the right. bar. Yeah, I couldn't find anything online. So I guess I, I'll, I'll have to reach out to them directly. Uh, but one example is like, for example, uh, I think it's New York. Um, they also allow undocumented, like California. Um, so regardless of your immigration status, you're allowed to take the bar. Um, so I, that's another thing to consider. Like if you do want to go to a law school and sometimes like they're very like regional, sometimes you're able to get like your future job prospects, like where the law school is. Sometimes it's very like relationship based. That's also another factor to consider. Um, so yeah, just think about like, am I even able to take the bar in the state that I'm planning to go to? Um, and yeah, so just think about those things. Um, if you plan to study in a state outside of Texas, um, yeah, and call, if you don't see it in like our, I'll share the resource with you. There's like a resource that um, I helped create uh, that's specific for undocumented applicants. And I can share it with Amber. Maybe she can share it with um, absolutely. general community. I, can. I absolutely can. But it's titled Law School Resource Guide for Undocumented Students. Um, and it's getting to law school. And I think it's helpful for folks, regardless of their immigration status. Um, you don't have to be undocumented, even though it's mostly like centered in the undocumented experience. I think the information is good for anyone. It talks about the law school journey. Um, however, that's a really important thing to consider. Like, am I able to practice in the state that I want to be in? Um, so just think about those things and you can, you can always call the American board association and ju just ask them, um, or email them and they should be able to answer you. But yeah, okay. always do your research. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so with respect to, um, this, I get this question a lot from, from all students generally, you know, it's, if I want to practice in, I'm going to say California because you're in California, but uh, if I want to practice in California, do I have to go to law school in California? Can I, or if I want to come back to Texas, is it okay to, to go and, and, um, uh, study, uh, in California? And so I, I feel like I got a good, you know, beat on what the answer is based on what you just shared. But for the people that maybe are, are still trying to, to wrestle with where do I go to law school or where should I, I go? Am I bound to stay in that state if I study there? What is your perspective? That's a really good question, Amber. And I'm, 
you can also pitch in after my response. Um, but I think for me, um, you don't, you're not bound by the state that you study in. Uh, I have plenty of like, like I have colleagues, friends that like, for example, one of my colleagues, uh, she, she graduated from Harvard, but she took her bar exam in Minnesota, which is like so random. She did the um, bar exam in Minnesota. Now she's a licensed uh, immigration attorney. And again, immigration is federal law. So also think about like the law that you want to practice. Um, if it's like a type of law that is not like general across the states, then I'm sure you have to take like license exams to make sure that you also are able to practice that type of law in a specific state because sometimes like laws vary depending on where you are so just also think about like what is it that you want to study that you want to practice uh, but generally immigration law is federal so you can it, it, it's the same across the states again states vary depending in their state laws but immigration law is federal so even though she was licensed in in minnesota she's a practicing attorney in boston and california so it's just it's so like i'm like what <laughs> and she also lives in london so that's just one example um that i think that was an extreme example <laughs> that like you're not bound to the to the state where your law school is it really depends on many factors such as what is it that you want to practice um where it is that you feel more comfortable like working in how what are the job prospects in the area i think also like the law schools are very specific too like for example like some law schools they specialize in getting you like like future job prospects that are local to where the law schools are, which I think it's like, that's a lot of law schools. However, there are other law schools that like, regardless if you like are in that state or not, there are opportunities beyond where it is. So just think about those things too. But Amber, if there's anything you want to add to that, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely curious how the UBE factors into it. Right. So you've got, I mean, you know, thank you American Bar Association for, you know, the UBE, that was not something that, you know, whenever I um, was sitting for the bar exam, I had to sit for the Texas bar and to be licensed in Texas. Now we've got the UBE, the uniform bar exam that allows us to kind of cross borders with our uh, cross state borders with our, um, our law licenses. So with the UBE, um, you know, perhaps maybe somebody can, you know, sit for the bar exam in, in New York, the UBE, and then, you know, perhaps they could still practice, um, you know, at least with a specific case in that state and then, uh, you know, in a different state and come go as they please. Um, that is also a possible um, option, you know, outside of immigration law specifically, um, you know, if you're wanting to just do family law, if you want to just do criminal law, you know, I think the UBE might let you um, do that in different states, depending upon, you know, how that works for that, that um, say that you're wanting to practice in. But certainly, I think that um, I completely agree with Jesus that there's a, a lot of opportunity there. Um, you just pick the school that you want to start with and and um, do your research, do your homework, I think is the the name of the game here, just kind of making sure that you're prepared um, uh, and you have all the information available to you based on the state's legislation and the city's legislation and, and you're in good shape. I, I think that that really is good feedback and good guidance. But how do we pay for law school if we're undocumented, right? Um, or or if we are uh, DACA, because I know that there are, um, at least for DACA students, a very limited number of financial aid resources, right? And then for undocumented students, none um, uh, at the federal level. So what, how do they pay for law school? How do we, how do we find um, that we can get uh, financial help for the students that that fit within these categories? It's a good question. Um, I think for the most part, that sometimes ends up being like the deciding factor, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, for a lot of students. So uh, financial aid uh, is definitely scarce for undocumented students, but it's definitely not um, 
uh, absent. So definitely like there are opportunities. I know a lot of um, undocumented law school students that are, some of them have actually just graduated and are now, now starting their, their careers. Um, so what they have told me, and it's also on the resource that I shared with you, Amber, is there are, for example, like merit-based scholarships that yeah. are also available for students, um, the, like regardless of their immigration status. And those are mostly based on like the hard factors of your application, such as like the LSAT, um, <clears throat> your LSAT score, and also like the GRE. Those are just some of the examples of like they what they consider. Um, sometimes I think it's like they do like an index uh, of just like they kind of weigh like the LSA and the GRE. And I know for like a lot of students, like sometimes like those are kind of like not the strongest in their application. And I'm sure like there are many resilient students that have other factors as well. Something to also consider is that there are also um, institutional scholarships. So like scholarships that are available in the law school that a lot of people don't even know about. Um, a lot of my friends that are in law school, they're like, oh my God, I was like the only person applying to this scholarship. And it was like $60,000. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of schools literally just give money away and many people either they don't need it or they just don't know about them so also do your research um I know like for example I went to school in Davis um and they had like this King Hall um scholarship like the Dr. King um mm. there's a scholarship named after him and it's a very prestigious scholarship and it's also able to offer like a big chunk of your tuition, it's able to cover um, that for students. And I know that a lot of undocumented students apply to those scholarships because a lot of them weren't strong in their merit. Like they didn't, at least in, in like their scholarships ap application, like their LSA and the GRE didn't really stand out as much, but they were able to really just highlight other aspects about them. Like for example, their community service or their commitment to their community or what is it, how do they see themselves in the future um, beyond law school? And that really speaks to a lot of people. So that's just one example. And I'm sure there's a lot of like really fun, creative, like scholarship prompts that you might find um, in other law yes. schools. But yeah, there's also like, uh, as Amber said, um, loans are also very um, limiting as well. However, so for example, like undocumented students are not eligible for federal loans uh, because it's federal. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there are private loans um, that are offered. Sometimes we also hear about like tandas. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about that, Amber, no, but it's kind of like a Spanish. That. Yeah, it's like a Spanish term that like some communities have used. Um, so you see this a lot in like entrepreneurship communities or like communities um that are mostly like immigrant or like um folks that don't have a lot of like resources they kind of create this almost like a lending circle a community um, support. where folks yeah exactly it's like they they all pitch in and it's almost like they're lending money to each other um so it's I've almost like that it's this. called this sandas <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I've seen folks do that. Um, I actually have a law school student right now. Um, actually, she just got she just passed bar. But oh. um, yeah, here and she used Dandas. So um, that was a big chunk of like what she did. She also did independent contracting, like on the side. Um, she was doing like public speaking um and she was getting paid for it so students like if you have like a quality <laughs> about you um everyone has a quality like everyone wants to hear your story so if that is something that you feel like you're willing to do I think that's also something that like I have seen as like a lot of my friends and and people that I know that has worked for them and in, in paying their law school like that's something that you can definitely leverage um on your end but anyway uh, loans are limiting, but they're not impossible. There are higher interest rates for private loans. Um, on average, most students graduate with like, I think, I think it's like a 
$150,000 debt, but it could be higher. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's just like, just knowing that like, um, federal loans are not available for folks like us, but private, um, the interest rates are a little bit higher, but there are scholarships, um, available for students as well. So don't think about the, the impossibles. Um, I think there are creative ways to navigate about money. Um, and also like, uh, there's also GoFundMe. Um, some folks that I know also started GoFundMe's. Um, and you'd be surprised. There are people that have a lot of money <laughs> that yes. don't even know you and they're willing to give you money. So um, yeah, yes. also just, I know money is like a very sensitive topic for a lot of people of color. So um, I think also just start to reflect about your relationship with money and I don't know. I hope everyone feels comfortable talking about it and asking for it. I know for some, like I came, I came up in a immigrant community where like asking for money was almost like a stigma, mm. but when it comes to your education, think about it more as an investment and framing it as like, you are investing in my education. Um, and you'd be surprised in the amount of people that are willing to put in um, a few a few, a little bit of their money into your education. Absolutely. Well, I need to find out more about these tundas because maybe, you know, I can <laughs> benefit from that as well. <laughs> no, that, that sounds amazing. No. Um, also, I'll just pitch in too that there are also, um, I know local country clubs and things like that will also have um, scholarship applications available where, you know, you would not even, you don't have to be a member. You don't have to be a relative of a member, nothing. They just put it out Mm. there. It's publicly available. Law firms offer scholarships as well. And I've never seen that as a question on the application. Um, There are are essays that are are out there. Um, uh, And um, I recently hosted an event where I shared with students that Access Lex, Access Lex, excuse me, has a scholarship data bank um, with a plethora of resources for um, incoming 1Ls as well as current law students. So those Mm -hmm. are are definitely resources that we want to make sure that we take advantage of as well. Yes. So for example, like I I mentioned like merit-based scholarships Mm -hmm. um, and then also like there's need-based scholarships. So sometimes some schools do offer like regardless of like your LSAT or GPA, um, if there is definitely like an outstanding need, like if your family's like low income or if you are um, an independent and you're considered low income or you don't have a job, um, that could also be a factor for those scholarships. And then also there's conditional scholarships um, Mm. in case you haven't heard of them, but like, it's like, oh, if like an example would be like, if you were to get like this, grade point average by the end of like this semester then we will like give you this or or like for example we will give you this if you were able to like sustain that grade point average Mm -hmm. something like that which could be a little stressful for some I know like for me for instance I would be like oh my god like that's stressful (laughs) but that's also an opportunity I've seen that out there as well and then there's also like negotiating scholarships there's also yes. some scholarships that you can negotiate and something that a lot of people don't know is that when you're getting into law schools um a lot of law school offers and this was for me like because for undergrad you don't really get like a choice of how much money it's like the school decides take it or you. leave it <laughs> take it yeah. or leave it the number take it or leave it <laughs> but for um I don't know, like for law schools, I don't know how it works for like other grad school programs, but for law schools, they give you like an offer and you are able to negotiate it. It's like sometimes you're able to leverage other offers and ask for more. Um, So, hey, like you're able to also practice a little bit of like business and like negotiations. And I know it's some new turf for a lot of folks, but it's exciting at the same time because it the, your offer is not a final offer. It's almost like you have the agency to 
ask for a little bit more. And I don't know for, for you all, but like I'm an immigrant and we are experienced in bartering. So um, we're always yeah. like, no, we're always going to like try to negotiate for more. <laughs> no, I respect that. It's something that I, yeah, I'm personally not used to when I go shopping, whatever the price is, that's okay. That's what it is. Either I buy it or I don't. But yeah, I, I have, I quickly learned that on my travels that, you know, the number listed is not necessarily the number that you could end up paying, you know, you could get a good deal. Um, so, you know, to that effect, if you're, um, if you take the LSAT, you know, more than once and your LSAT score comes back a little bit higher than it was at the time that you submitted your initial application, that's a bargaining chip, right? Or, you know, something yeah. that you can negotiate with. Um, if you, um, if your financial circumstances change between the time that you applied and the time that you, you know, are getting ready to make your final decision for where you're going, that's also something. I know Jesus mentioned, you know, if you've got, you know, a better offer from a different school, that's also something that you can utilize. It's important to note that the school that you have the better offer from, look at the percentage of the tuition that is being covered, right? If, you know, they're covering 60% over here versus 40% over here, but this 40% looks way bigger than the 60%, then, you know, you, you just have to be mindful of those factors. What's another aspect? Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, basically, I think that the the at the end of the day, the fact that you can negotiate is really mind blowing for for all all the law school applicants just to make sure that they understand. Look, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to get as much as you can uh, before you even start. You know, I I think that that is a a great message, and I did want to piggyback off of it because I want to give you plenty of time to talk about uh, immigrants rising. Um, but one final question for anybody listening out there that um, is taking the LSAT is really trying to really go for those merit based opportunities, but English is not their first language, right? Mm. What do we do? You know, what are some tips? You know, how do we overcome, you know, um, this seeming barrier? What do we do? Oh my God. Like that was just my struggle. Like I am not a test taker. Um, I actually didn't score high when I was getting into undergrad. Um, I took the, I think it's, it was called the SAT. Yes. I took the SAT twice and I like, that was a nightmare in its own. And I also did the ACT did really bad. And I think I saw statistics that like a lot of folks were like, English is not their first language or for folks that are like people of color, um, they tend to score a lot less in yeah. standardized tests. So anyway, I think you all at this point know what my feelings are about standardized tests. And I don't think, I, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like they're a way to like weed out our community, <laughs> but, um, no, but I do also feel like, I mean, just also like a more, um, educated approach is like, I know that like a lot of schools use it as a way to like predict, um, success um, during law school and beyond. So I, I can see kind of their point. Um, but for folks that are struggling to do it as I did, um, I recommend like taking a course, honestly, like if you have the means or if you have a community that's willing to pitch in for um, for your like, in, I don't know, I want to say like invest into like a, a course, I used blueprint. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of great resources out there like seven sage. I think there's also like Kaplan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like, the, there's so many. Yep. 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 So look into like, which I know each of them has like different styles of like teaching as well. Um, look into like also which one is best suited to your way of learning? Like, for example, I'm a visual learner. So like Blueprint, um, the way they use their like materials are like very colorful. And like, they are also able to like, I don't know, make things look a little bit nicer. And like, for me, the way I learned was a lot better. And I was able to score like, I don't know, I was so surprised. I scored a 160 in my LSAT. And I thought that was like a little bit like, like who did <laughs> it was like a, a little great, bit moment <laughs> that's a great score I, know, I was like yeah I was like that is not me but <laughs> but um 
Yeah, no, I think that just shows like um, to really think about like what is the best way you learn? Because sometimes like other people might tell you, oh, this is what I did, but that's suited to how they learn. So really just think about like, what are some ways, even like when, if you're in school right now, how, how do you learn best? Do you, are you like a visual learner? Do you listen to things better? I think seven sage um, is just like materials that you're able to like just review, but I don't think there's like a instructor. I, I don't really know do your research but yeah (laughs) it's live online they do offer course instruction with live online for but and it's it's not it's not structured the same way it's kind of like um you know today i need logic games i'll have a live online instructor for logic games or today it's just structured differently i've been doing my homework on the the difference (laughs) of some of these folks and i think oh just so that you guys know i'm pretty sure that blueprint in texas is called score perfect Mm-hmm. I, they, they, there's a, another company by a similar name, but the company that you're referring to in Texas is, is referred to as score perfect. So for those oh. of you in Texas that are looking for it, I can't find it. It's, it's called score perfect for us. Oh, that is so interesting. Even yeah. though it's like online, I don't know, like I did my courses online. Yeah. Um, so it's like, uh, there's, I think it's got different names, like test masters in one place. Oh, true. In another score perfect here so i believe that that's that's the company that we're looking at score per, score wow. I, I, I was confused as well at one point i was like oh is this a different no it's the same just in texas <laughs> we've got a different name okay <laughs> okay i mean it is yes. what it is but also just knowing that like i will say like for me it was also like a culture shock and this also kind of like prepares you for the law school experience but like attending these courses a lot of the people were really white or like I don't know, I felt like English was like their forever language, <laughs> their generational <laughs> language. But um, for me, it was almost like, okay, this is the space I need to like, it, it was almost like preparing me for the experience. So just think about that as well. Um, and also, I want to really highlight a resource. It's called JD Next. Mm. And it's uh, like a way to kind of go around the LSAT or the GRE so my people that are like I don't know the LSAT the GRE is not for me there are law schools out there that um, are kind of taking a very holistic approach to law school applications and there are ways to kind of go around the LSAT and the GRE um, in your law school application so I just added the link um, in the chat and I'm sure it could be shared with with folks, but it's called JD Next, and it's for fall 2024. Um, and some schools that are accepting this are like, for example, University of Dayton, Drake University, um, oh, wow. City University of New York, which I think it's CUNY. It's a really CUNY. good school, CUNY, <laughs> um, for public service. So if you're interested in like, um, I don't know, careers in public service, it's a really good school for that. Public interest, sorry um uh davis my school is there so (laughs) that it has a really good immigration law program so anyway there is a big list of schools too so just think about it too if you feel like um you're not scoring in the range that you feel like it would make you a successful applicant um but you feel like law school is still calling to you i feel like this is a really good resource for you um, to not let it deter you into getting there. Um, Because it's as someone that kind of leads this pre-law program that I'll be talking in a little bit of minutes. um, It's just kind of disheartening to see that a lot of students come in motivated to the program in the beginning, but then once their LSAT scores or their GRE scores come back, it's almost like they kind of feel like, they're not ready or they feel like law school is not for them uh, just because of those scores. And I'm like, no, like I am one example where it just like, I don't know, undergrad, for example, I did so good in undergrad, but my standardized tests reflected, like did not reflect me at all. So just think about those things too. Um, I have a lot of friends that scored very low in the LSAT and they are Harvard grads. They are 
graduates from like all these law schools and now they're doing like corporate law they're doing um cybersecurity law and it's just like you know it's not a defining factor to who you are um and you get to decide whether that's going to define you or not and you, and um there's this resource that i just shared so really just check it out excellent keep your yeah, options open next JD Next is definitely going to be um, coming to the Pre-Law Center YouTube channel very, very soon. So just be watching for that because we've got some info sessions set up. So just be watching for that. Um, but without further ado, I would love to hear more about the Immigrants Rising Pre-Law Program. Tell us a little bit about um, the upcoming boot camp because I believe that that's coming up uh, later this month in October. Um tell us all the goods give us all the things of course so i'll add the link to the program so our pre-law program is pretty much like um for folks that haven't heard i'll start with immigrants rising for folks that haven't heard about immigrants rising we're a nonprofit that's actually based in um california in the bay area um which is like in northern california um san francisco oakland and um our mission was really to just make sure that like undocumented students feel like they they can pursue anything that they want to regardless of their immigration status um that be like higher education careers entrepreneurship regardless um of their goal that immigration status should not hinder their ability to move forward with their goals so that's pretty much like what our vision has been. Um, and a lot of the stuff we do has been around that. And with that comes my program, which is the pre-law program. And it's a pipeline program. And the way I designed it is um, we start with the webinar that's actually going to be hosted um, at the end of the month on the 26th of October. So I invite all of you to um, join the launch of the program. Amber, you're also welcome to join. Um, <laughs> let me add the webinar link. And it's just, um, we're gonna be having a lot of speakers that can relate to the experience of being undocumented um, and going through the law school journey. And they'll be talking about specifically um, just the law school application process through the lens of an undocumented student. So questions that like a lot of pre-law programs don't really cover, like, for example, fee waivers and how they're only open to DACA recipients mm. um, or how to talk about your personal statement if you're undocumented. And if you decide to kind of like what we talked about today, how to but really going deeper into it, like how to talk about your immigration status if you decide to talk about it um, or what, like, should I talk about it on my agenda or my diversity statement? Mm -hmm. um, just really different factors. Also like the LSAT. Um, I didn't know uh, when I showed up that I had to present an ID. Thankfully, I had an ID with me. Mm. But I've had a lot of undocumented students that don't have a state ID. Um, and that's just something that could be a little bit scary for them. And perhaps LSAC has no idea <laughs> That this okay. is something to consider as well. But yeah, I think that that's just, um, oh, anyway, we start with the pre-law 101 webinar, which um, we really just talk about like the general aspects of like the law school application process. We hear a few stories from folks that have gone through the process and are either um, graduates of law school or are current law school students. Mm -hmm. Um and then later we host a pre-law program, I mean, pre-law boot camp, And that has really been designed from my experience of attending a boot camp, like an exercise boot camp. And I was like, okay, this is like short and intense. <laughs> and <laughs> pretty much like I was um, motivated by that. I was like, oh my God, what if we kind of incorporated that into like a pre-law um, space? and really just give folks the technical knowledge that they need for their law school applications. Um, and this is designed for folks that are that they know that they want to apply to law schools, but they're not sure when, they're not sure about their timeline. And okay. we really expose folks to like workshops about like personal statements, scholarships. Uh, we have a lot of panels of like current law school students or current uh, or folks that have graduated from the program and they want to talk about their experience or some uh, legal professionals that are um, undocumented 
So, um, yeah, this is it four just, days? How many it's days? Four it's days. Four days. Yes, okay. It's four days. Um, <laughs> and it's also on the link as well. If you, fo- okay. if folks want to see, uh, but I think in the link, it'll show you like from the last year, cause we'll be updating it, um, as we get closer to the pre-law bootcamp. Um, but yeah, it's four days and it'll be hosted in, uh, I think, I believe it's in December and yes. And, uh, by the end of that boot camp, folks will be given the opportunity to apply to the pre-law fund, which is, uh, it gives folks $2,500 to 10 folks, um, out of the boot camp recipients. Uh, 10 folks will receive uh, the fund, which is $2,500 to cover their application fees. And with that, we also host gatherings uh, while they're applying to law schools and we check in, we have speakers. We also just brought in a coach that talks about like, okay, what are your goals? How do we get to your goals? Um, And we're also currently working on a mentorship program um, during that last bit so really doing one-on-one mentorship with a current law school student and them reviewing your law school application before you're ready to send it out but yeah it's very comprehensive it's (laughs) it's exciting and lots of good things and so for the people that are you know thinking oh my gosh how am I going to pay for all the law schools that I want to apply to you've just been given a gift in the form of a wonderful resource, both intellectually and financially. So, um, and, and just that I understood in order to be eligible for the pre-law fund, you do have to participate in the boot camp, right? The December. That's correct. And it's all virtual. So for folks that are in Texas, uh, it's actually a national pre-law boot camp, um, and pre-law funds. So folks, um, have applied from like New York, uh, Illinois, from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Texas, California. So we have folks from all over. Um, and because it's still a fairly new program, we launched in 2019. Um, it's still kind of like, I know it's expanding, it's getting bigger, it's getting traction from a lot of folks because it's it's the only like program that's designed for and by undocumented people. Um, so yeah, I just really want to encourage folks that if this program speaks out to you, uh, apply and, uh, you can start by going to the webinar and checking out, um, a little bit of the resources that we have in mind for all of you. And we're going to be sharing the bootcamp application, uh, during the webinar. So yeah, I encourage all of you to, to check it out. I love (laughs) it. Ask me questions. I love it. Well, definitely make sure that you guys attend the session on October 26th, register for boot camp in December. What are the dates for December? Does we have them out there? The boot camps, uh, let me just double check. And while he's doing that, I will just share um, that Jesus is fantastic and and so very open to communicating with um, any individuals that may have any questions. So when I share and post the video, uh, he, he beat me to it. Uh, when I share and post the video, um, I am going to also share his contact information so that any students that have any questions can reach out to him directly um, and confidentially and, and, you know, be able to be free and open with any questions that they have, you know, about the program, just about themselves and about, you know, uh, applying, um, But uh, definitely, I'm so thankful that we got a chance to do this, Jesus. This was really, really informative. And um, certainly as a pre-law advisor, um, it can be challenging to be able to um, share the proper guidance. So I'm appreciative of you that you um, so graciously shared your story and your experience um, so that um, many others can come and and follow in your footsteps and and find success and, and live their dreams. So Thank you Absolutely. so much for being here. Thank you, Amber, for giving yes. me the space. And for yes. folks that are um, part of other UT campuses that are seeing this, I encourage you, like I am open to collaborate um, and I'm open to also go speak to like your schools if you want me to like uh, join in like a virtual space like this as well. Um, I just want this program to be available to anyone um, that doesn't know about it. So please, um, Yeah. Thank you for, for giving me the space. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And we want to make sure that as many students have access to this as possible. So yes, please, 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 you know, schedule uh, a virtual session. And I'll even go uh, a step farther for any students that are, are listening from any other institutions. If your student organizations want to perhaps yeah. um, involve um, Jesus and Immigrants Rising uh, with their, their organizations, this is a great uh, platform, um, a great organization. So thank you again. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time. Um, and with that, I will say, Goodbye. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, everyone. Have a good afternoon.